Welcome to Ability Assistance. My name is Phyllis Jones, Chair of the North Andover Commission on Ability Assistance. My name is Stacy Leibowitz, Secretary for the North Andover Commission on Ability Assistance. This month is a special show, a legislative roundtable with all four legislators for North Andover discussing just some current legislation pending on Beacon Hill. Welcome to State Senator Diana DiZaglio, State Senate Ma Minority Leader Bruce Tarr, Representative Trom Wynn, and joining us remotely is Representative Christina Minacucci. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you, Phyllis. It's great to be with you and Stacy, and it's also great to see how technologically you've been able to incorporate Representative Minacucci. Isn't that fantastic? Well, it's a great example of a technological adaptation to a challenge, and I think there's a metaphor there for exactly the work of the Commission and this show. Next month on our January show, we're actually going to be doing Adaptive Sports New England, and the gentleman who does that particular organization is partially blind, cannot drive, was going to Uber out here, and instead I said, no, 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 we'll do this. So we're really happy about this technology. Fantastic, fantastic. I know that uh, Senator DeZoglu and I are both skiers, and we often talk about skiing, mm -hmm. and oftentimes we see adaptive ski programs on the mm -hmm. mountains of New England, and it's always impressive uh, to see the uh, maximization of ability of skiers that are involved in those kind of programs and I know it happens mm -hmm. with other sports as well mm -hmm. and so we look forward to that show is that so that's airing in next January. month in January? January. January. That'll be our January taping. Great. But to the reason why we're here today <laughs> we could talk for hours on wonderful things. Um, Stacy and I went through what's pending on Beacon Hill. You've got a lot going on so by no way do we expect this to be an entire culmination of everything that's pending on Beacon Hill as it pertains to those who are considered disabled. And just so you know, when Stacy and I did our final review, this is as of the information we had last week, Saturday. So if, for example, you hadn't already signed on to this bill and we highlighted it for you and you've signed on since, we're not aware of that, just so everybody is aware of where things are at. Sure. All right. Um, we're going to take this down a list a little bit, give you each a little time to figure out your notes because we've got a lot here. Um, the first one we wanted to discuss is um, called the Equal Access to Medical Treatments Essential to People with Developmental Disability um, or Autism. And the one thing I think we really liked about this one was this one um, allowed for tablets, mm -hmm. alternative forms of communication which is really a big deal for somebody who either is afraid to speak or um, nonverbal. Are nonverbal. I, mean, I know I yeah. oversee programs. I work for Bridgewell and I oversee programs that we have three autism programs and we have a lot of individuals who are nonverbal. Some may choose not to speak but many are not capable of speaking and not having access to technology really hinders them from being able to communicate in a way that helps them to interact with the world. So it'd be great to know a little bit more about this legislation and, uh, and steps forward. And I think also for our audience, this really talking through this to break it down in a way that's understandable for the lay person who's watching. So we can start, well, first of all, we should give you just an update on process. Okay. And okay. so as we sit here right now, we are just wrapping up the first year of a two-year mm -hmm. legislative yes. session. And it's really important to understand that as of November 17th, the legislature completed its formal sessions for the calendar year. And that means that right now we are in informal sessions. And one thing that's important about Massachusetts government that a lot of people aren't aware of is that our Constitution actually requires us to meet every 72 hours. And so even though you may read in the newspaper or hear on television or radio that we're not meeting, we actually are. Yes, I get an email Monday through Friday um, master list, yes. I think, yeah. and it'll tell me who's in session, whether or not you're in formal session, informal right. session, what committees are meeting that particular day, um, and some other news of what's going on in the realm of government. So it's important to understand that while we do some things in informal sessions, in fact we passed uh, the most recent ARPA bill, so-called, in an informal session, but only after each branch had fully debated it and it had been subject to public hearing, 
But generally speaking, in informal sessions, we transact sort of routine matters where there isn't a lot of debate and there aren't recorded roll call votes. So something of a, the nature of this bill, which is extremely substantive, is something that we wouldn't likely take up in an informal session. I believe it was filed by Senator Keenan. I and believe I think it already right, yes. had a public hearing, um, and it's in the uh, Committee on Children's Families and Persons with Disabilities. Yes. And, and I'm going to stop talking in a minute because I don't want to monopolize <laughs> the conversation, but I, I would like to make a point, and that is that we as legislators through the pandemic have been become far more aware of technology and the importance of technology, particularly for folks that could be otherwise isolated yes. because of the need to combat the transmission of infectious disease. And so, for instance, we've seen technology like tablets work very well with seniors mm -hmm. and other folks that don't have as much mobility um, as maybe the rest of us. But, you know, one of the things about the pandemic is it doesn't play favorites. No. And right. so everybody is vulnerable, and that's why having access to more technology is important. I'm going to stop there. And I want to add to that, I want to congratulate you all for the new name. Uh, and we also passed that. Yes, I, I heard. It's <laughs> going to the really governor's great. desk. Yes, that's great. I know. And I, but I mean, I have heard from several colleagues who are very interested in this new name, and they were very thrilled and wanted to see yeah. if this could kind of spread along to other communities. And you know what, really we, kind of, we kind of stole it a little bit. Oh, um, well, no. <laughs> good that you're admitting th this. this is, like, well, there <laughs> used to be, and maybe it'll hopefully come back to Boston, um, an expo, oh, the expo called, yep, called yep. the Abilities Expo. And we really liked the name of that. And I remember going up to mm -hmm. the people who are running it in Boston, and I'm like, do you mind if, you know, we I'm like, well, we don't have, you know, on the word ability, you know, anybody can do that. And we had a long mm -hmm. talk about it, and we realized there's a lot of nomenclature. It might just be, just be the way things are said, but it means a lot. Mm -hmm. And ability assistance, now we're not focusing on what people can't do, i.e. not communicate. We're now focusing on what things people can do right. with some assistance, i.e. a tablet. Got it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, for... I Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm going to tell you a little story about this and why this bill is so interesting to me. Um, my son had a scribe for many years because while he was passing all of the variety of tests as far as um, you know being able to communicate, he couldn't get his thoughts onto paper. There was a delay between thoughts and paper. And so we had a scribe. So we had a teacher who had to sit by his side for all classes to write his thoughts. Um, finally, after fighting year in and year out, finally in third grade, we convinced the school to give him a computer because we knew he could type. And what was really interesting is that they didn't want to give him a computer all these years because it wouldn't be fair that other kids didn't have computers right. and he did. And so what happened, he went from producing zero written work to being a writer for the school newspaper and being an absolutely That's off fantastic. the charts phenomenal writer. So this one little thing um, to, to everyone else, it seemed like it was a little thing, but to us it was huge because it allowed him to unlock his ability and allowed him to really flourish and show a talent that nobody really gave him credit for having. So I find this is something that everybody should have access to. And, and now isn't it interesting, now in, you know, post height of COVID, hopefully it's the, you know, we've passed that point, but now all the children in all the communities or most of the communities, at mm -hmm. least I know in North Andover, the schools are being provided Chromebooks to give to the students so that they can participate. So now the, the one thing, you know, you could say, your son was ahead of the time. <laughs> And I think this piece of legislation too, um, it starts the conversation, right, about yes. equitable access right. to opportunities right. that exist, right? And you were talking about the tabs, but I'm thinking about the story, uh, Stacey, that you shared with mm -hmm. us as legislators about... Um, My sister. Your sister, yeah. thank you. I wanted to allow you to say that. No, um, that's okay. <laughs> and, uh, and how there was this, you know, sort of cliff with her being able to obtain services where, okay. you know, she had a limit due to this 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 test of you know needed to be 70 uh but you know she happened to get 72 yep. and was automatically off the cliff and unable to access services mm -hmm. due to two points of a difference um obviously somebody that was in need of services according to the stories that you shared with us here um but unable to do so because right. of you know some reforms that really really need to be made in state government and the way that we are approaching these very challenging um, 
issues and providing services. Uh, so I think that this bill and bills like this yes. start the conversation about how to more equitably address the distribution and accessibility of you know the, the services that we do provide here in the Commonwealth and make sure that we're looking at things like this. I, I don't know if this particular issue, I don't think it is, is a, is a part of this legislation, but no, it's a part of when a different we take it up, when we take yep. it up, I would love to you know, augment this bill or another bill like it mm -hmm. by focusing on this cliff effect that we're seeing here yeah. where, you know, folks are just unable to obtain services based on a couple of numbers difference. Yeah. And, and we've learned, oh, I'm sorry, you go first. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're both so passionate and, about and all of this, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, there are numbers and it's also having, you know, have a lifetime of this with my sister, but also working in the field that people don't fit in a box. Mm -hmm. And I think so That's there's right. accessibility to the service, but and looking at an IQ or looking at a number, but also looking at the comorbidity for people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've worked with people with disabilities who have substance abuse disorders. So things are kind of boxed. The And, and I understand that things move at a certain pace and also we deal with things that have been very structured for decades. So there's a slow process. And people but aren't I, data points and, and we need to take yeah. a more exactly. holistic approach of exactly. looking at all. <laughs> Like the um, whole person, as right, I was exactly. saying in the story. And there's a really critical point here, and that is some of the testing that's done in Massachusetts puts people in silos. So that's for it. instance, there are a number of different prongs to the test exactly. that denied your sister those services. Right. And yet we look at an averaging that doesn't take into account a deficiency in one area where in another area there may not be a deficiency. A and the practical result of that is someone doesn't get any help at all. Right. And you know those are things that are very sensitive and that we need to approach carefully, but I'm glad the point was raised mm -hmm. because it really is a fundamental structural issue mm -hmm. that prevents people from getting the care that they need and it's not that um, we want to give folks care that don't deserve it but we have to be more tailored into how we do it to get a better fit than the one we have now sometimes. Right. And talking about bo uh, being boxed in, I think that it's great that you all are highlighting these bills because as you all, we all know, over 7,000 bills are filed and so it's so yeah. important for you to highlight them. But I want to reiterate the point earlier when you were talking about, oh, I try to just grab a few, but I think that the important thing is to have a lens for people with disabilities. So all bills should have that yeah. lens and not just the, these particular bills with exactly. the word disability Point. on them because I tend to look at bills in like four different types of buckets in terms of uh, access and resource. So number one, so increased resources for those who mm -hmm. need it most and uh, to expand access to make sure that we are thinking through it. Like, it's great that the resources are there. How do they get access to it? And then happen? providing opportunities mm -hmm. rather. So in addition mm -hmm. to all of these things, we are talking about opportunities to get employment, college. Yes. What does that mean? How do we assist them? And then lastly, addressing discrimination because to your point earlier about the uh, words matter, and that's why I love the name so much, but also thinking through where are we using these words in our laws and how do we address them? And so some of the bills that are not, um, that you haven't highlighted, that I want to highlight for you are Bills are looking to use more positive terms, more inclusive terms uh, throughout, you know, all of the, right. <laughs> the mass laws and right. constitution and otherwise um, to make sure that people actually feel and um, themselves reflected. We in actually our found that. Um, I think that's 116. Is that 116? Yes. So there's also 240, 240 is another 240. one. That's yeah. Okay. So it's a reference to yes, dare what, I say uh, it, mental retardation. Yes, yes. So it was S116 yes. exactly. where. Exactly a lot of the bill yes. was changed from um, retardation or mental retardation yes. to, to more positive nomenclature. Right. However, we noticed that the, I think it's the chapter of 123B is still entitled mental retardation. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. So maybe if you guys can, can go back to your offices and verify that it is and maybe somebody mm -hmm. can put forth the bill right. mid-session. Su suggestion for a good piece of legislation <laughs> actually and you're hearing it here first <laughs> live right. on North right. Andover uh, no, uh, Well <laughs> live to tape but close. <laughs> right. but but before we move off though I, I do want to point out just for folks that are tracking mm -hmm. um, there are actually um, a House and Senate version of the first bill that we were yes. talking about. Yes. One was filed by Senator Keenan at Senate 115 and the House version is filed by Representative Barber. They both did have their public hearings 
on October 29th of this mm -hmm. year, and that's yep. important to know. Yep. Uh, but one thing that folks should know is that committees generally will still accept testimony. So if somebody's watching that's us, right. don't feel that you're excluded because the public hearing is over. Committees generally will take your written testimony and still um, continue to hear it. And it's important to uh, be succinct in what you say, let folks know whether you support the bill or whether you don't support the bill, but also, as, as we're doing right now in our conversation, suggest possible changes. Complete it, it makes yeah. complete sense to do it that way. And going back to Senator Zaglio's point about how things aren't boxed in, I mean, you and I learn, Senator Tarr, about how people don't notice when resources are needed until they're needed. That's right. COVID yeah. was, I think, a huge, a huge microscope on that yeah, issue to, to be able to say, you know, these services that we're talking about are needed, but even something as simple as a push button on a door, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and you look at it and go, how did this get past the building inspector? And until you're that person who needs to have assistance in opening a door, you don't notice those types of things. And I think it's wonderful that the state legislature has been able to try to put a positive spin on services based upon what we've learned during COVID. And I think during the shutdown, Phyllis, to your point about, you know, not knowing maybe sometimes that you need it until it's there and you go, wow, I really needed this. Yes. Uh, telehealth, telehealth services. Yes, my that son was, takes advantage of that. That was a huge thing that we had been pushing in the Senate for years um, and, you know, had some challenges getting it through the entire process and drawing attention to uh, the fact that it was needed before the pandemic. Right. Um, but during the pandemic, because so many more people needed access to those services, there was a real light shined on, you know, making sure that we got something passed and we were able to get something passed and uh, really give more folks access to the services um, for healthcare of all kinds across the board to be able to get access to their doctors, to, mm -hmm. um, you know, to make sure that they were connected, they could get their prescriptions, they could get their counseling. Um, the, the, big thing, it was. the big thing um, from my family yeah. was mental health counseling mm -hmm. with my son. You know, if it wasn't for the fact of the telehealth, he wouldn't be able to meet with a psychiatrist or a psychologist mm -hmm. because the services just aren't available in this area mm -hmm. because there aren't enough providers. Not to say that there are no services, but there aren't enough providers. So he's meeting with a psychiatrist and a psychologist. One's out of Newton, the other's out of Brookline but he's doing it from either the comfort of one of the offices at the school once a week or his own home at night, depending upon which doctor it is. And I thank you folks for the telehealth option because otherwise, you, you know, at least people can then have doctors in different geographic areas mm -hmm. and it makes it easier for them to be able to, to obtain those services. So I think mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a really important point here and, and of course we definitely want to talk to you about our mental health bill before yes. we conclude this show. Most definitely. But, but there's a really important point here and that is that we all discovered the need, the greater need for telehealth and we've been able to do that on a transitional basis. But it's also important that we make it a part of the permanent landscape yes, for health care and mental health care. So um, we passed a bill in the Senate, a broad health care bill. Is that, that the 100-page bill that yeah. started yeah. at 77 <laughs> pages with 150 yeah. amendments? <laughs> yes, yes, it is. But, Welcome but, to the Massachusetts legislature. Yes. <laughs> but, but the important point is that we also have two House champions of that uh, concept here. And our legislative delegation works together. Yes. And so that bill is now in the House. The House also has passed a bill to help our community hospitals, which is coming to us. Mm -hmm. And our hope is to be able to champion that bill just as we know they will champion the issue of telehealth. So this is something that's evolving and something we'd like to keep you posted about because we Anytime need- Anytime yeah. you send, you know, yeah. your staffers know us, we know your staffers, send me an email and say, hey, Phyllis, you know, Senate one, two, three, you know, and the corresponding bill is, you know, House four, five, six, whatever it is. Send it to us and we have a Facebook page and we can put it out there mm -hmm. so that then people know about it and then if it is more relevant to that person, they can know, okay, I can contact Senator or Representative and mm -hmm. talk to you about it to give them more involvement and more understanding so that they feel more like they're being cared for. Right, and vice versa too. We want to hear from yes. you about the issues right. that you right. care about, just as we discussed right before the taping about the shortage of 
providers, providers and yeah. what does that mean yeah. for wait time and what does that mean in terms of the support that we need to provide on the front end to even mm -hmm. get people into the this field end. for right. human services right. to provide for people with disabilities, whether it's a day program or um, having people to, um, to I told you about my, de my desire to Absolutely. learn ASL. Yeah. Exactly. And, and there's no funding to help me do that, right. um, but yet there's an incredible need for ASL interpreters mm -hmm. out there. And we need the same support in, as you said, our day services and to, I guess, to piggyback on the telehealth because where I work, we deal with telehealth as well. And I think part of the concern, because we have seen the need, COVID has sort of been the mother of invention in that respect, but also there's a push and not just with telehealth, for our day programs, we had to pivot very quickly and do online programming instead of having people, we, we had to shut down. Yeah. And so there's that piece where we have been able to support people through virtual programming, but now that's kind of waning, but we have seen that some people actually did better right. with virtual, but yet there's a disconnect in some respects with the state and with some of the, um, I guess, financial support that we would get that, okay, we have to end that now because everybody's back. But I think there is a need for it because some people perform better, they do better, they have an outlet if there's no other um, way to provide a service. So I think those are things, again, it's showing the flexibility and the support for people's needs, whether it be telehealth or virtual. Um, so I would and I have two other things to add about that, which I think is really important. In, um, in Lawrence and in Haverhill, which are two communities I represent, many, you know, I heard more from those communities than North Andover about lack of access of a place to sit and do telehealth. Mm -hmm. And so it allowed PCCD, which I know you've had on your show before, um, Professional Center for Childhood Development, they do a lot of um, early intervention and they found that kids were dropping off because they couldn't do in-home services. Yes. So they were able to set up kiosks where families could go and safely bring their children in an enclosed space that would be just for them and those are opening in public spaces so that people can continue to access early intervention services. So that's one example. The Boys and Girls Club in Haverhill opened up spaces during the pandemic where anybody who needed a place to access telehealth could come, get access to the internet, have an enclosed space, which is quiet. And we, we heard about that from, from people all around where they just, they wanted to access the telehealth, but either didn't have the technology or didn't have a quiet space that was theirs to talk about personal things. So I think, you know, that's something when talking about equity to kind of think about yes. creating more public spaces for people to access the telehealth so they can talk to somebody in Newton, even if they live in North Andover. Um, and then the other thing is in the ARPA bill, there's a little bit more than $11 million that went in there to support community health centers and having um, mental health, behavioral health um, nurse practitioners and to, um, to recruit and retain um, mental health practitioners in community health centers. So I think that that's important and speaks to what you're talking about, Phyllis, and not being able to find a provider when the provider is in need. And, and I would say for us, like it's it's kind of outside of, I think what a legislator would typically be doing to help people find mental health providers, but I get those calls. And I didn't get those calls before the pandemic, but people are getting to the point where they have run out of options and they're turning to me to say, do you know anybody taking patients? Do you know any place where I can get services? And I think that with that ARPA bill, other people across the state were realizing that too, and, and we realize that's a place where we need to um, put more funding. Yeah, that's, that's speaking definitely. about increasing access to opportunities and just to piggyback off of what the rep uh, just was talking about with the ARPA bill, I know we wanna get to this uh, Mental Health ABC Act addressing barriers to care, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, which we've all been working on, and this bill was largely driven by the recognition that mental health uh, is as important as physical health yep. um, and that healthcare should be healthcare, a holistic mm -hmm. approach, right? Um, so some of the things that, you know, we could just get started with this conversation, yes. because I know this is very important to you. Um, look, just a couple of things that this bill addresses is guaranteeing an annual mental health wellness exam at no cost to the patient, uh, creating an online portal that enables access to real-time data to move patients from emergency to appropriate care, 
uh, expanding access to psychiatric care by requiring that state contracted and commercial health plans uh, cover mental health and substance use disorder challenges uh, and benefits uh, that are offered through the psychiatric collaborative um, care model. Um, also uh, filed in this piece of legislation was an amendment uh, by Senator Tarr and I to address uh, something that we haven't talked about necessarily yet today, uh, care for veterans in our communities regarding mm -hmm. PTSD. Yes. We had uh, been working on this for several years. We actually passed a bill several years ago in one of the, the veterans uh, bills that was done, I think it was the Valor Act one or two, um, but uh, to create a, a task force and a commission in the state to look at the uh, areas of mental health with our returning veterans who are found to be 41% more likely to commit suicide. Yes, unfortunately. Uh, than they are to be killed in the line of duty. Right. Uh, so, that, you know, the fact that we're investing all of these resources in, you know, uh, supporting, sending our young men and women abroad, um, but then when they come home, knowing that they don't have any of the services that they need to be able to uh, re-enter and re-assimilate and get back into uh, the, the workforce and, and their community, um, you know, 41%, I mean, that is absolutely- Startling. Yeah. Yes, yes, it's shocking, it's unacceptable. Um, and we were supposed to have this implemented several years ago when we passed this in the, uh, you know, the veterans bill that was taken up. But unfortunately, the administration never actually implemented what we asked them to do. And we had to uh, refile this amendment, readdress this issue, and we just passed it yet again in this Mental Health ABC Act. And we're hoping that, you know, it will go all the way to the governor's desk this time, be signed into law, and that this time the administration will actually implement this commission and make sure that we're working to really examine that PTSD that occurs amongst other things uh, with our returning veterans and get them access to services. N now yeah. to piggyback a little bit going back and forth in terms of different pieces of legislation, another PTSD bill that we highlighted was PTSD specifically for, um, I will, I'll use the term just first responders mm -hmm. inclusive, mm -hmm. okay? Um, that I think is fantastic, going, looking at it on its face. The, the, we had some concerns when looking at it because my son has PTSD. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I know other people have PTSD and anxiety issues. And putting a five-year cap on it, why was a five-year cap put on it? Because any, you know, anything can, can trigger it. Sure. So, so number one, it does sound a bit arbitrary, and we have to try to put a limit on it. So we, that's something that's still in evolution. But I do want to point out that um, Senator DiZoglio and I actually had three amendments in this space. And one of them that got adopted unanimously was also to screen not only veterans, but police and firefighters mm -hmm. for mental health issues, because mm -hmm. they do have that's stressful great. jobs. And we never know um, what's going to trigger a particular issue. These mm -hmm. folks are out there on right. the line defending us every day, whether they're in the military in that context or whether they're helping provide public safety or responding mm -hmm. to us in a medical emergency. These are stressful things. So we were able to get another amendment passed in the Mental Health ABC bill, which would provide for that screening. And, you know, Senator DeZoglo is being a bit modest because the program she's referring to, she actually championed and got passed years right. ago originally to look at a commission on this subject. There is another commission in the bill, however, that looks also to promote access, to actually be um, speaking in loud terms to let people know that services are available. We also uh, successfully got an amendment passed to add to that commission's charge going out and proactively reaching out to veterans. So we are trying to to cover those bases. Right. No, in fact, I also wanted to bring up, you had, and I don't know if it has been folded into the, the major ABCD bill, but you had filed, Senator Tarr, an act relative to disability pensions for public safety employees who are victims of violence mm -hmm. that kind of correlates a little bit to PTSD. Was that also 
It was not. That's a standalone bill that's okay. making its mm -hmm. way through the legislative process. It's actually a bill that's been uh, filed for a couple of sessions, and our former colleague, um, Senator Ken Donnelly, um, who had been a professional firefighter in his other career before coming to the legislature, and sadly he passed a few years ago when he left us, mm -hmm. but he was a champion of this bill, and his former aide, who is now Senator Friedman, okay. um, has also been a champion of this. So we're still working on it. It's a work in progress, but the idea is if you meet with violent circumstances on the front lines, then you shouldn't have to fight uh, to get the additional pension that would normally come mm -hmm. for that. It should come automatically. Yes. Right now, a family, um, if unfortunately the individual does not survive, or the individual themselves, if they, they do survive, they have to fight for that through a separate process. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something we're trying to address. No, and that, and that should be, you know, right there, no question. So. If you have it, you get it. Yeah. You've earned it. Yes. I do, to piggyback a, a question, so for the act related to disability uh, or death caused by PTSD, there were a lot of exemptions that we yes. caught through that that I wanted to follow up on because I think a lot of times when you have PTSD, it affects your job. It affects, you know, your life in general. And there are a lot of things here about job reassignment, disciplinary action, uh, even, you know, a demotion, resigned, um, retired. Uh, and all of these could be due to PTSD, but they're considered exemptions. So I don't know if that's still a work in progress to discuss that because so many times people develop other issues with PTSD that affect their ability to do their job. So I'm not sure what the details are around that piece. Well, so it, it goes again <laughs> in the category of work in progress, right, but yeah. I thought, again. Fluidity in motion. <laughs> yeah. Fluidity I mean, in motion, but we wanted to ask yeah. because obviously being on this side of, exactly. you know, and dealing like your son has PTSD and, and all of the other people that we have worked with who have that, can affect so many aspects of well, their we, lives. Um, I, I think that we need to provide support for folks with yeah. PTSD so that, or other um, mental and behavioral health concerns so that they could be successful mm -hmm. in their jobs. And exactly. I think that, that is, um, there is a pending bill to address that issue. Okay. For this particular bill, this is relating to the PTSD that you get from your job mm -hmm. and the support to provide after that and we take your feedback to heart and we'll certainly go you know okay. back to yes. look at this more carefully to see how that's crafted but that's to your point it goes hand in hand of like right. the, these are not just individual symptoms or or um, issues like they basically so like out the, the IQ issue yeah. it's exactly. not boxed in right exactly right. it affects the entire person and yes. you know as Diana was saying like the holistic piece um, you know, it's, it's a whole person type of situation, and so it also doesn't affect one aspect of your life. So that's why we wanted to bring that up. Well, absolutely, and yeah. I think that it's important to, um, to your point about the the support, the additional support, yep. yes. is that actually uh, this past year I was able to get a commission mm -hmm. um, to study how to support people with disabilities and other that's issues right. to allow them to continue their, uh, to actually gain employment and then to be able to stay employed because of all the additional resources that they might need access to, to your point, ability assistance. How do we assist yep. them and highlight their abilities? And so I'm I'm really excited to be working um, to get that implemented and make sure that we continue to provide the support that they need. Right. Now, I want to bring us back in total. We all here understand commissions and why commissions mm -hmm. need to be put together and why reports need to be put together. But for those of us who are not into understanding, they just want to know the services. Mm -hmm. I shared with you folks my son's journey from when he had a seizure back in the third grade. Um, it was the flu. He finally got diagnosed with epilepsy. Um, he was getting better in terms of being able to refold into uh, society after some therapy and, you know, having physical therapy and, and emotional therapy. And he was doing great once he was able to fold back in. That was in the third and fourth grade. Sixth grade hits and we hit COVID. Mm -hmm. And we can all sit here intellectually and say, and every one of us could have looked at my son and said, it's not just you this time, the entire world has closed down. It's not you've gone into the hospital for three months and now you're gonna go back to school and you've lost all your friends again. But he could, because of his executive functioning skills, he couldn't hear that, no matter how many doctors, parents, 
teachers, remotely friends told him that. And then throughout the seventh grade, he missed almost all of the seventh grade. There was no, the hospital didn't speak with the school system at all to be able to provide him any sort of remote education. So the town was barred from providing a federal benefit of a fair and appropriate public education. And he was in and out of the hospital, was it four times, Stacey, I think? Yeah, at least. Where each time he was in the ER for two to three weeks before he went into just a general pediatric room for another three to four weeks to then be in the locked facility for another three to four weeks to then be sent home. And it was this constant, for lack of a better term, cat chasing his tail throughout all of the seventh grade. And now, you know, thankfully the town has been able to put something together and he's being sent off to an assessment um, collaborative, which will hopefully get him back the services he needs to get his, his federal education. But, you know, let's, let's look at this legislation that you filed, which I know is fantastic, but let's break it down. How would this have helped my son if it had already been in effect? So it's a really important question, and it's one that um, in, in the Senate we really want to talk about right now, and we know our, our House colleagues will want to talk about this. But one of the things that we did in the Mental Health ABC bill was create a database so that when someone is in an emergency department, they can be tracked for a bed. So the providers that are running that emergency department can find a bed because we all hear it constantly. The horror stories about someone who needs longer term treatment, and the term that we use is boarding, they're yes. boarded in an emergency department for days or weeks or months. And an emergency department has a very important role in our society, yeah. but it's a triage role. It's treat and stabilize. It is not to provide extended care. So one of the things that we were able to do in the Mental Health ABC bill was create that database. So if I'm a provider, if I've got a patient in the emergency department, I can look statewide to see where there is a treatment bed to be able to get that person into. And we do two separate databases, one for adults and one for pediatrics yes. because they're different populations. Yes. But we also know that creating the databases is one step. We actually need to have the beds. So one mm -hmm. of the things that we do is suspend a bureaucratic requirement, which is called the determination of need, which any provider needs to go through in order to add a treatment bed in Massachusetts. We suspend the requirement for a DON if you are creating a mental health treatment bed so that we can That's create a fantastic. little bit of an incentive to be able to A, cause those beds to come into being, and then B, provide a tool for folks to find them when they need them. And there's another important point, and that is our mental health system, uh, particularly when it comes to pediatrics, we always hear about various issues. One of the things in the Mental Health ABC bill is a comprehensive periodic review of the entire system. I noticed and that. And so one of the things that we were able to do is amend the bill. Initially that review was to happen every five years. But you amended it for we every three. We amended it for three because by the time you get the review done and take action, we don't do want an extended yeah. period of time to go forward. So. It made sense to go to three years. Any shorter than that wouldn't allow for the full comprehensive review, but any longer than that will take too much time. And you had mentioned, Phyllis, the, the issue of studies. We want to make sure that we, when we do studies, they translate into action. And that three years versus the five, while it may seem like a simple change, will translate into a very important change. One more yes. thing, just because Senator Tarr did such a great job at breaking down pretty much everything <laughs> that that bill does, uh, in addition to everything that he said, uh, staff supports in the ARPA bill. Uh, we put in uh, several million dollars into uh, state services to provide for staff supports because what we found out was even though uh, in some facilities there are uh, you know thousands of beds with 500 at a time potentially uh, being identified as having been vacant, uh, the reason why they were vacant was because there weren't enough staff to actually support that patient coming in. This has been a huge issue in every area right yes, now, right? right? And we've been hearing about it. Uh, but in particular, you know, in particular when it pertains to mental health services, uh, even when the bed becomes accessible now due to these augmented services, we still need the staff to be able to care for that patient, and that's been an incredible challenge. So those ARPA funds are going towards providing more supports to train people, to get them into this field, uh, and to make sure that we have uh, supports with, with 
human on human uh, yeah, <laughs> contact no, as well. As a mother, I can tell you that that was also a huge thing because you know, my son needed to be watched 24 seven. And you know, very kind people were there to assist him, but sometimes there was a language barrier. You know, and if you have, a, a, especially a young person, or even an, an adult, if there's a language barrier and they're already in a situation where they don't know what to do with themselves, sometimes my son would come out of these seizures and have almost like an amnesia state and he would start eloping which if you don't know means running off mm -hmm. um you know so and all of a sudden if you can't communicate with that person you know so having a system where you're trying to to at least put this in place maybe offer scholarships to kids who want to enter those fields or tuition um, mm -hmm. forgiveness if they go to the state schools to be able to do that is that in a thought process at all there, there definitely is a lot of discussion about what these supports should be. So loan forgiveness is often discussed if someone mm -hmm. remains in the profession for a period of time. Mm -hmm. Tuition at the state, state schools is an interesting issue. And as you mentioned this, we're at the forefront of that issue right now because we are starting to talk about how can we engage our state schools in a better way in terms of creating more capacity because one of the staffing issues that we face is that we have lots of folks that would like to go into these professions and we have lots of folks that need their care mm -hmm. but there's a bottleneck yes. and so we hear about long waiting lists in instructional programs to be able to get through so one of the things that we're hoping to do in the new year is initiate a, a more vigorous conversation about how we can open up that bottleneck how we can address it and maybe even utilize the tech schools at more shops and, and let that be a training ground as, you know, as a stepping stone mm -hmm. to, to get things going. I mean, we, I think we could all sit here all day long yeah. talking about this legislation and I don't even think we've touched half of what no, we had we hoped haven't. to, um, which I think is fantastic that, that there is so much. I would like, and I think it's fair to say on behalf of mm -hmm. the whole commission, um, invite you to any time something comes across your desk that you're like, gee, the people of North Andover's Commission on Ability Assistance might be interested in that, email it to us. Let us take a look at it and you know, put it out there for you so that people know. This is not politics. This is government. Right. Politics is what happens when you go to the voting booth. <laughs> government is it doesn't matter your background or mm -hmm. whatever, your party affiliation. What matters is, is getting the job done. And Absolutely. we want to help you help the residents of North Andover get the services that they need. Thank yeah. you so much for having us today. No, we thank you. And thanks we to everyone today. tuning in. Yes. 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 Thank yes. you so much for being and here. And please share your stories because what to your point of how the laws and all this legalese, mm -hmm. we need to make sure that it translates yeah. to the people and Absolutely. to make sure that the story, yes. you know, your we'll stories um, are highlighted. Yeah, so thank you. Because, I us. mean, a legislator or an attorney who can read a bill and say, okay, at, you know, section 123 of chapter 124, line 66 will change the, the line from the number seven to the number eight. Most people aren't going to understand that. That's right. That's right. They need to know what happens in the real world. Correct. And on behalf of the North Andover Commission on Ability Assistance, thank you again to State Senator Diana DiZaglio, State Senate Minority Leader Bruce Tarr, State Representative Trom Wynn, and State Representative Christina Minacucci. You can learn more about what's going on in both the State House and the State Senate by visiting their website at https double forward slash malegislature.gov. Join us in January, as we already mentioned. We are going to learn more about Adaptive Sports New England. In February, our guest will be Deanna Lima for Community Support Coordinator here at the town of North Andover's Police Department. And in March, our guest will be Joe LeBlanc, North Andover's District Veterans Services Coordinator. We're consistently looking for new topics to explore here on Ability Assistance. If there are any specific topics that you'd like to learn more about, please email me directly at pjones at northandoverma.gov. 
We would like to thank our, our volunteer crew from Curry College and from the Greater Lawrence Technical School. And I hope I get everybody's names correct. Uh, from Curry College, we have Carly Jones. And from Graphics Communications, uh, we have John Coffey. From the IT shop, Alan Garcia. And in addition to watching through your cable station, you can catch all of our programs on demand via YouTube. And if you have Roku or Apple TV, there's an app called Cablecast, the North Andover Cam website. And you can also catch us via podcast on Podbean. Wishing you all a happy and safe and healthy holiday season. See you next month. Thank you. Happy holidays. Everyone. Happy holidays.